Hi everybody, I'm Nick Verreke and I'm a PhD candidate at Patosens at Ghent University at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Today I'm going to talk about Mycoplasma bovis. Let's start with a little introduction. Mycoplasmas are kind of special bacteria. They are also called the odd men out. Let's start with a little characterization. Mycoplasma bovis is the primary agent of bovine respiratory disease in the bovine cattle industry. They are quite special as they have no cell wall. This confers them natural resistance to beta-lactams, which are targeting the cell wall. They also have a peculiar genome. It's only one megabase pair long, and it is comp um, comprised of highly repetitive regions. And it has a very low GC content, which makes it quite special for sequencing. For veterinarians, there's no vaccination at place at the moment in Europe, and so they rely on antimicrobial resist uh, antimicrobials as first line as an empirical treatment. Now, of course, they can't use any antimicrobial drug. They just use the guidelines provided by AMCRA in Belgium. On the first place, they can use fluorphenicol, followed by macrolids, tetracyclines, and at the end, we have fluoroquinolones. They are flagged red because they can only be used upon a proper diagnostics. We have to establish an antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Now, let that be one of the big problems with mycoplasma bovis. There are no epidemiological cutoffs available at the moment. This is because of the lack of clinical breakpoints and the lack of standardized protocols in different labs all over the world. How is current diagnostics done? Majorly, they are culture dependent, taking up to two weeks before you can get one species identification and antimicrobial susceptibility testing on the phenotypic level. Now, we can already get to species identification by using a molecular qPCR. However, if we want the phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing, we need to wait way longer. So it's not done in a routine way nowadays. However, here at the faculty, there has been some work done by one of my colleagues, Jade Bokma, who has used a culture-dependent enrichment method to already perform species identification from a pre-enriched culture. But again, here, there's no potential, potential for a quick antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So we don't get to a complete diagnostics. Now, the question, how can we implement long read sequencing to identify point mutation markers for all-in-one whole genome sequencing diagnostics in both human and veterinary medicine? Simple answer, you would say. Rapid and accurate consensus genomes are required for this. That's why we implemented long read nanopore sequencing for Mycoplasma bovis on these pre-enriched cultures. This does not only provide species identification, but it also gives information on the strain. In addition, we can perform antimicrobial susceptibility testing on the genetic level. Now we still have to confirm that the phenotypes and genotypes are in relation to each other. That's what we've done in this work. A little on the side, we want to improve it, Patosense, the human and veterinary diagnostics in general. We want to revolutionize diagnostics. We want to offer a complete sampling to diagnostic and mycoplasma identification. In the future, based on the work we are doing at the moment, we want to supplement it with antimicrobial susceptibility testing on the genetic level. Let's go to the methodology. How have we started this work? We used 100 Mycoplasma bovis field strains from Belgian cattle collected over five years. They were identified using the Malditov method and the pre-enrichment of Mycoplasma bovis. Then phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing was performed on the antibiotics shown here on the slide. We used the microbial dilution for this to determine different MIG values for each strain. Then we performed whole genome sequencing using the Minion sequencer and a custom-trained Bonito base color model, followed by KNU and Medaka polishing. These genomes, together with the phenotypes, were then included in a genome-wide association study using the KMER base TBGUAS analysis. We used the KMER of 31 base pairs long. We are compared wild types versus non-wild type populations, and we included a phylogenetic tree to prevent any bias towards evolutionary mutations. A little side note again, who attended London Calling 2020 maybe have see, has seen my spotlight presentation there. We succeeded in generating high quality and complete mycoplasma bovis genomes using long read sequencing only. Now we still improved our Bonito model and we actually reached up to FRED scores of Q50. 
on average 10 mistakes in one mycoplasma bovis genome. In addition, if we compare this to short read sequencing such as MySec, we could actually obtain 70% of all genomes having 90% contagious. So that's an additional advantage of using the long read sequencing. Now, going, let's go to these exciting results. How did which identification of point mutations have we done? Let's start with the androfloxacin. It's the red flagged one, but it's a quite important one. We could identify mutations that are um, linked to the gyrase A and the topoisomerase 4. Fluorokinolones block DNA synthesis, and these two genes are actually the two major targets of fluorokinolones. In this case, eight strains belonged to the non-wild type or resistant population for endrofloxacin. If you look at the bottom, you can see the output of the dbGuas analysis. Every circle represents one kamer. A gray, a light red or light blue circle indicates that this kamer was identified in almost all strains. If you see a dark blue or a dark red circle, this means that there were the kamer was identified specifically in one of both populations. If you look on the left, we have the gyrase A showing two specific mutations associated with the resistance to endrofloxacin. If you look on the right, we have the topoisomerase 4, showing four mutations identified which were associated with the phenotype. Now you will say, are these real associations? So we checked again phenotype versus genotypes in a phylog phylogenetic analysis. In the first column, you will find the phenotypes where you have a highlight if there were increased MIC values indicating resistance. Indeed, the highlighted um, strains were, were the ones showing the two mutations in the gyrase A and the topoisomerase 4 genes. Now, we could additionally evaluate the previously established epidemiological cutoff values based on the phenotypic data. This is done using the visual method. Normally, we would say, using this method, that we would set a cutoff around 2 micrograms per ml. However, if we look at the genetic level, we can actually lower this to 1 microgram, as there were some strains that were in, in a kind of gray region in between. Another thing that we could see, and that has been published before, is that there's a synergistic effect between mutations in the gyrase A and the topoisomerase 4 genes. You need two mutations, one in each gene, in order to get a resistant strain. Now, you might wonder, what is the relevance if this is a red flagged antibiotic drug? Well, we can here already say, as an advantage over phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing, that even within the um, non and within the wild type population, we can actually not treat these with enrofloxacin. I would not do it as this would put additional pressure on these strains, which would eventually result in additional mutations and confer them conferring new strains resistant. We did the same approach for macrolids, blocking protein synthesis. Here we have major targets 23S ribosomal RNA and ribosomal proteins L4 and L22. We tested camitromycin, tilosin tartate, and tilmycosine. For the first two ones, there was about 50% division of the wild type and non wild type population. If we look on the right, you see the circle plot again, where we could identify the exact same figure for tilosine and camitromycin. Indeed, these mutations were identified to be present within the 23S ribosomal RNA structure, localized on the exact spot where the macrolides are binding to the 23S ribosomal RNA. To continue further, we, see, we could see that there were some strains having double tilosine camitrosine resistance. We could explain 86% of these strains based on the genetic data that we observed. We got double mutations because there's two different alleles of the 23 ribozo S ribosomal RNA in mycoplasma. If it was present in both alleles, the mutation at position 2058, we got a double resistance. If there was only one mutation present, but if there was also a mutation in the RPLV gene, as indicated on this picture, then we also got a double mutation in 86% of the strains. There was no clear association between the RPLD and the phenotype. So we also had some single telosin or gametrosin resistances, but there were no clear associations. We also included tilmycosin, which, where we only had one strain belonging to the wild type population. So all strains were actually resistant to tilmycosin, but we still looked if we could find the prototypic mutation that has been published before. 
Indeed, we identified that all strains had the mutation in both 23S ribosomal RNA um, alleles at the position 748. Now you might uh, wonder, how is it possible we can't explain everything here? There are still so many other potential mechanisms involved here, as it is a quite complex mechanism how antimicrobial resistance is happening. We can go to methylation, but there's also possible involvement of transcriptomic regulation. We still have covered some other antibiotic drugs, of which we use gentamicin. Gentamicin targets the 16S ribosomal RNA, we also, again, had only one strain, but here again, we could identify two unique mutations that were only present in this strain that was showing higher MIG values for gentamicin, exactly at the position where the gentamicin is binding. For other fluorphenicol, tiamoline, and tetracycline um, antibiotics, we could not find any conclusive data because there was a very low number of strains that were belonging to the non-wild type population. Let's conclude what we have discussed here. We generated high quality and complete mycoplasma bovis genomes using nanopore reads only upon the implementation of a custom trained Bonito model. This allowed us to reach up to Q50 scores for one single genome. In addition, superior to short read um, approaches, we got complete circular genomes. Also, the use of a genome-wide association study, as in this case, dbGuas, can support the definition of new or newly to be established ECOF values. Additionally, it allows to identify known, but also known point mutation markers. This knowledge is of great value in rapid all-in-one whole genome sequencing-based diagnostic tools, because the sequencing data is readily available, lowering the time from two weeks to less than one to two days. And it immediately includes species identification, typing, and genetic antimicrobial susceptibility testing. What's next? How does the future look like? We want to implement this, all this knowledge in an all-in-one diagnostic test, identify all potential BRD pathogens, including viruses, bacteria, and mycoplasmas. This is already done on PathoSense, where we also want to implement the genetic antimicrobial susceptibility testing to deliver a rapid targeted treatment to actually the veterinarians. This will also result in lowered use of antimicrobial drugs. We can assess the involvement of methylation and transcriptomic regulation, which is an advantage of using native DNA sequencing. We can extrapolate this to other pathogenic species in human and veterinary medicine. Interested in more? The paper on this work will be submitted soon, so stay tuned on our Twitters. To end, I still want to thank all the people that were involved in this work. If you have any questions, please ask them now.